let's turn to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 10. And I think I'm using the, the church Bible, in which case page 574. Uh, Isaiah chapter 10, starting in verse 5. Ah, Assyria, the rod of my anger, the staff in their hands is my fury. Against a godless nation I send him, and against the people of my wrath I command him to take spoil and seize plunder, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. But he does not so intend, and his heart does not so think, but it is in his heart to destroy and to cut off nations, not a few. For he says, are not my commanders or kings? Is not Calno like Carchemish? Is not Hamath like Arpad? Is not Samaria like Damascus? As my hand has reached to the kingdoms of the idols, whose carved images were greater than those of Jerusalem and Samaria, shall I not do to Jerusalem and her idols as I have done to Samaria and her images? When the Lord has finished all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, he will punish the speech of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the boastful look in his eyes. For he says, by the strength of my hand, I have done it, and by my wisdom, for I have understanding. I remove the boundaries of peoples and plunder their treasures. Like a bull, I bring down those who sit on thrones. My hand has found like a nest the wealth of the peoples. And as one gathers eggs that have been forsaken, so I have gathered all the earth, and there was none that moved a wing or opened the mouth or chirped. Shall the axe boast over him who hews with it, or the saw magnify itself against him who wields it? As if a rod should wield him who lifts it. Or as if a staff should lift him who is not wood. Therefore, the Lord God of hosts will send wasting sickness among his stout warriors. And under his glory, a burning will be killed, <coughs> like the burning of fire. The light of Israel will become a fire and his holy one a flame. And it will burn and devour his thorns and briars in one day. The glory of his forest and of his fruitful land, the Lord will destroy both soul and body, and it'll be as when a sick man wastes away. The remnant of the trees of his forest will be so few that a child can write them down. In that day, the remnant of Israel and the survivors of the house of Jacob will no more lean on him who struck them, but will lean on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. In truth, a remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob to the mighty God. For though your people Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will return. Destruction is decreed, overflowing with righteousness. For the Lord God of hosts will make a full end as decreed in the midst of the earth. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, O my people who dwell in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrians when they strike with a rod and lift up their staff against you as the Egyptians did. For in a very little while, my fury will come to an end and my anger will be directed to their destruction. And the Lord of hosts will wield against them a whip as when he struck Midian on the rock of Oreb and his staff will be over the sea, and he will lift it as he did in Egypt. And in that day, his burden will depart from your shoulder, and his yoke from your neck, and the yoke will be broken because of the fat. He has come to Ayath. He has passed through Migron. At Michmash, he stores his baggage. They have crossed over the path that Geba they lodged for the night. Rama trembles. Gibeah of Saul has fled. Cry aloud, O daughter of Galim. Give attention, Elijah, O poor Anath. 
Medmana is in flight. The inhabitants of Gebin flee for safety. This very day he will halt a knob. He will shake his fist at the mount of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. Behold, the Lord God of hosts will lock the bows with terrifying power. The great in height will be hewn down and the lofty will be brought low. He will cut down the thickets of the forest with an axe and Lebanon will fall by the majestic one. Father, help us this morning. Uh, we just sang that you are immortal, invisible, and uh, we realize much of you is hidden, but thank you that that is re re revealed in Christ. He is your word, and this is your word. These are your words for us to hear, and they reveal you to us. So help us to see more of you this morning. Amen. So um, please keep Isaiah, to, quite the reading, wasn't it? So um, let's have that open in front of us because we're going to need to be looking through that uh, throughout the next um, period of time. Um, but before we get to it, I'm just going to start with a question. And I'm going to ask it now, but we're not actually going to try and answer it to the end. But this is my question. Um, how do you measure the love of God? How do you measure it? How do you measure how much God cares? Now, don't want you to answer too quickly. I want you to actually think about this. Really, really ponder that for a second. Because how will you measure it in the in the day to day? So this afternoon, uh, tomorrow, next week, what kind of things will happen to you that will make you think God's love depends on them? You know what? What if, for example, you'd have a bad day? Or a good day, you know. How would it that make you feel about how God loves you? Maybe you've got one of those days where everything just goes wrong. You know, where you get a flat tire and and then your shopping bag breaks and you're late for your, for dinner and smash your favorite mug, all that kind of stuff. On those really stressful days, how would you consider? What would you think about? How would you measure God's love on that day? What about more serious things? What about a flight cancellation? Getting COVID again, as many people are. What about car crash? What about illness? What about cancer? What about death? Do things have to be going well for you in order for you to really believe that God loves you? Because maybe you're tempted to wonder that he doesn't care. He doesn't care about the, the little things. Maybe you think... Uh, you're being punished when things go wrong. Or, or maybe it's not that he doesn't love you. Maybe it's more that there's nothing you can do about it. Have you ever thought that? Maybe he could do more. Maybe it's out of his hands. Maybe he can't control the big things. So what would it take uh, for you to question God and his, and his capability, his involvement, or even to question his love for you? What would it take? Now, we'll get to that at the end, but, but here in Isaiah, um, God's people are going through a testing time. And honestly, that is putting it lightly. Things are not going well for, for God's people. Um, you'll remember chapter nine last week. Um, the, the northern kingdom of Israel, they've been told that judgment is coming for them. The Assyrians, uh, they're not just going to uh, invade them, they're going to take them away, they're going to carry them off into exile. Israel is going to be destroyed, there is no returning from this, this is bad news for Israel, the northern kingdoms, it's their end. And little Judah in the south knows that God has also said that their destruction is coming. But first, the, the spotlight's on Israel. And you might wonder, where is God in all this? Okay, destruction is coming to Israel. Where is God's love? Because, because Assyria, this, this superpower to the north, it's on its way. Okay, it's this looming presence on the horizon. It's coming towards them. It's like, can you imagine looking out to sea and seeing a tidal, a huge tidal wave on the horizon? It's charging towards you. It's this 
this huge looming presence and it is powerful it's relentless it's imposing it's going to be vicious it's this it's an impending doom okay that's what israel sees this, this tidal wave this this kingdom of assyria is coming towards them and this passage as the assyrians come it shows us three things about this impending doom three things about the incoming of the assyrians but really what it shows us are three things about god we learn three things about God in these verses. Because immediately, importantly, although you've got this impending doom on the horizon, that there is something bigger than that. There is something bigger than Assyria. This seemingly unstoppable force is overshadowed here by something even greater. There's greater powers at work here. And so this is the first point, okay? This is the first thing that we learn, and it's this. God is bigger. God is bigger. And not just bigger than the Assyrian army, God is bigger than anything you will come across in your life. Verse 5 and 6, if you just cast your eye down to them, says this. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, the staff in their hands is my fury. Against a godless nation, I send him. And against the people of my wrath, I command him. Now we have to get this. Assyria, this impending doom that's on its way. Assyria is a tool in the hands of a sovereign God. That's what's running all the way through this passage. Assyria is God's tool that he is bringing against Israel. A tool, like a, like a club, it says, or, or a rod. In, in fact, in verse 15, we read that Assyria is an axe, and God is the woodcutter, wielding the axe. And, and listen, an axe is powerful, right? Axes are strong, they're powerful, they're useful, but they are nothing without the person that's holding them. <clears throat> You know, imagine you, you're going to chop a tree down, for example, and uh, the question Isaiah is kind of getting us to ask is, is, is who or what actually cuts the tree down? Is it the axe? Or is it the man? Well, it's, it's kind of both, right? Because, because the, actually it's the, it's the axe that does the cutting, it's the axe that does the work there, but without the man, without the force behind it, it would just lie there on the floor dormant, wouldn't it? It can't do anything. An axe is no threat to anybody until it's picked up, until it's wielded. You wouldn't be afraid of an axe if it was in the hands of somebody you knew and loved, would you? In fact, later in Isaiah, uh, similar images are used, but, but a serious of an axe now is described as a horse, and God is the rider. Powerful, energetic beast, isn't it? But it's directed by the one who uses the reins. This is, this is biblical language here. This superpower nation who is uprooting countries and sculpting the world, they are nothing but a utensil, a small tool. And God is bigger. That's the point here. God is bigger. God is bigger than Assyria. And so God is using Assyria to bring his justice upon Israel. And, and Assyria, they are this, this godless, pagan nation. But the truth is, right now, Israel is even worse. You see, they, they had knowledge of God. They turned to idols. In verses 7 to 11, and we'll get to these again in a second. Um, we, we read not only why Israel was being invaded, we also read why they're losing. Because, of course, they are fighting back, but, but we read that they're, they're losing because they've turned away from God. So even on the verge of destruction, the issue isn't that they're not strong enough. The issue isn't that the fact they haven't got armies. Their issue is idolatry. In many ways, they're worse than Assyria because they had the light of God's word. They threw it all away. They should have known better. And so God is bringing his righteous judgment on a godless people who have utterly rejected. 
Because you see, what, what Israel did is they made God small. Perspective is so important. We talked about this in, in chapter seven. Do you remember? Um, Judah is scared. They're scared of Assyria. They're scared of this superpower. And they see them as big and mighty. And they saw God as small. And so they turned to Assyria. That's what idolatry is. It's turning to something other than God, making it big, making it, you know, fill your mind and fill your view. And you, you can't see anything past it. You can't see anything other than it. For me, when I was a, a teacher, um, it, it was what people thought of me. That became the big thing. That became the idol. I made that bigger than God. I, I cared about people's opinions. I cared about their approval. And, and those people and their words, they became powerful, became a superpower. And, and God became small, comparatively. And that was so destructive for me. That was one of the unhappiest times of my life because, because I can't think like that because I've got to remember God is bigger. God is bigger than anything else. And whatever the, the biggest, most terrifying, most powerful thing right now in your life is, it is nothing to God. For the Israelites here, um, nothing was bigger than the most powerful, deadly kingdom in the world. It's pretty big, isn't it? And yet Isaiah says, they are so small compared to God, they're just like a tool in his hands. Just a small tool in the hands of a bigger God. It can't do anything to you, Isaiah says. Which is good news if you're on God's side, isn't it? An acts in God's hand, you don't have to worry about it if you're on God's side. God is bigger. Bigger than the Assyrians. That's the first thing we learn about God. God is bigger. Uh, so secondly, we also see here that God is just. God is just. Assyria is a, a tool in the hands of God. Uh, and yet we also see that Assyria is fully responsible for their actions. Because look what happens. Okay. I found this on the web. Isn't that helpful? Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Check it out, it says. That's what we're going to do. Assyria is fully responsible for their actions. Because look what happens. After God is done with Israel, he turns his focus on Assyria. Assyria now are about to be judged for what they've just done to Israel. Now, this is important because uh, <laughs> we've got to get this bit as well. Assyria is a tool used by God, and yet Assyria is also held accountable for its actions. Verse 12, when the Lord has finished all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, he will punish the speech of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the boastful look in his eyes. When God is done with Israel, he's now going to turn to Assyria as well. Isaiah himself knows that the, um, the axe metaphor, um, it's great about making God look big, isn't it? And the power and the sovereignty of God. But it falls down a little bit because an axe can't think. And people can. So what he does is he, he gives us a window into the heart and the mind of the king of Assyria. He gives us a glimpse into what's actually going on in his head. Because although that God has, has got this plan for Assyria, God's got this divine mandate for Assyria, uh, although God's going to use Assyria, they refuse to acknowledge it. They refuse to believe it. Their motives don't match up with God. Uh, and just take a look at verse 7 onwards. I'm just going to use the NIV so you can hear this very clearly. This is, what's, this, is, this is talking about the king of Assyria. Isaiah says, God is going to use Assyria, but... This is not what Assyria intends. This is not what he has in mind. His purpose is to destroy, to put an end to many nations. The Assyrian king, he's just out for himself in all this. He doesn't care about being used by God. In, in six verses, the first person language is used 11 times. The king goes, me, my, I, my hand. My commanders, he is fully responsible for his actions here. 
He doesn't care about God. He doesn't care that this is God's plan. In fact, he thinks the God of Israel is nothing. He thinks the God of Israel is, is just like all the other worthless idols. He's not any better than Baal or Marduk or, or any of the other gods the king of Assyria has destroyed. He probably thinks he can destroy God. And God says, well, isn't this like an axe now, boasting to the one who wields it? That's the heart of sin, isn't it? There is a creator of this world, and there are creatures in it, and yet our, us as creatures, we just throw them away. We think we can do without him. Like an axe trying to throw away the person holding it. I don't need you. I can do it myself. It's pride. It's, it's acting as if this world belongs to us. You remember Nebuchadnezzar, he did the same, didn't he? He looked across Babylon and he said, you know, look at what I've done. Look at what I've built. And we're all guilty of that. A second ago, I said that we make, we make other things big and we make God small. But also we make ourselves big and make God small. My life, my plan, my choices, my successes, my destiny, I don't need God. And this is what happens. Verse 16, therefore, the Lord God of hosts will send wasting sickness among his stout warriors, and unto his glory a burning will be kindled like the burning of fire. Disease and fire, that's what's coming for the Assyrians. That's what's coming for their pride. Two things that show complete destruction, inside and out. Disease destroying from the inside, fire destroying from the outside. So it's complete. It's absolute. In fact, the, the picture Isaiah gives us is like, a forest. He says, imagine a forest, a woodland, woodland, strong, proud, you know, trees as, as, as far as the eye can see, this, this sea of green. But along comes sickness, and along comes fire, and it is burnt to the ground. That's the Syria. All that's left is stumps and blackened earth, and as I says, <laughs> now imagine sending a small child in to count what is left. That's what happens in verse 19. Such is the destruction that where there used to be thousands of trees, now even a child could count what's left. And it's an illustration, but, but don't let that rob you of the, the seriousness of what Isaiah is describing. here. This isn't trees he's talking about. These are people. This is a kingdom. This kingdom won't remain standing because rebellion against God is a serious thing and, it, and it's widespread. Things are looking pretty bleak for, for the nations. Israel is about to be destroyed. Israel is going to be destroyed. Chapter 10, Assyria is going to be destroyed for destroying Israel. We read that, that Judah and Jerusalem, they need to be worried because they're, they're going to be next. But here is the wonderful hope of these verses. Verse 20 onwards, the wonderful hope. And the third thing we're going to see, the first was God is bigger, the second that God is just, and finally, God is faithful. I don't know, do you remember the name of Isaiah's son from chapter 7? Sheer Jashem, Sheer Jashem. It means a remnant will return. A remnant, this, this group of people, amidst all this destruction, a group of people will be protected. God has made promises to his people. In these verses, he's called Yahweh, and the covenantal God who has a relationship with his people. And so he's going to look after him. He's going to keep them. And even in this passage, we get, we get wonderful reminders that, you know, God has kept his promises before. So he will keep them again. In places like verse 26 you, and others, you can, you can read how you know, they're, they're reminded of the whips of Egypt. Bring them through the, the waters of the Exodus, these little reminders. He's saying, do you remember those things? Yes, there will be destruction. But 
in the ashes of that wood where that child is walking, from the blackened, scorched earth, there will be a shoot. There'll be this little flash of green bursting through the black. God's going to preserve his people. His people. And that's a challenge, but it's also an encouragement. God's going to preserve a remnant. But that remnant, they need to be characterized by faith. Faith and repentance. And Isaiah is saying, is that you? Is that you? Rebellion to God was widespread. So destruction of the people was widespread. But there are a people who have turned to God in faith and they'll be preserved. Verse 20 says, in that day, the remnant of Israel, the survivors of Jacob, will no longer rely on him who struck them down, but will truly rely on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. These survivors, these, this remnant, they're the ones who put their trust in God. <laughs> and he's saying that they've changed because, because do you remember where they put their trust in before? We mentioned it a second ago. They turned to Assyria in their fear. They turned to the to human power. They, they turned to human strength and, and the people they saw around him. But now it says, now they turn to God. And if you put your trust in God, then God will keep you. That's why Isaiah is saying here. God will preserve you. If you have faith in him, he will watch over you. And you can have complete confidence in that, by the way, because it's no accident that Jude is preserved. You may think it is. Israel's is destroyed, uh, Assyria is destroyed, and somehow amongst all of that, little old Judah survives. Now listen, Judah only survives because God said they would. Superpowers are being toppled here in these chapters, but, but what reason is there for this small kingdom to survive other than the fact that the sovereign Lord has a plan? He's in control. So this whole chapter is saying God is on the throne. He's working for the ultimate good of his people for his glory. So, so how is it good? How is this stuff good news? How is there good news here in these verses? Because it, it, it's a series, frankly, of, of quite dramatic and brutal events, isn't it? How is this good for the people of God? And look, there's, um, there's loads we could say here, um, loads we could go into. One of them being the fact that sin is very serious. Sin is very serious. In fact, it's far more serious than we could possibly imagine. And so it is good for the people of God that sin is dealt with. And it is dealt with. But more so, God's people here are protected from the nations around them. Verses 20 to 23 talk about this. It says that all this judgment, all this stuff that's happening, it's for the remnant. It's for God's people. It's not by human will. It's not by chance. It's not, you know, the mechanical operation of historical forces. It's God. It's God doing this. Why? Because from that remnant, from that people he's preserving, is going to come a king, God says. A new king. A better king. And in the chapter to come, chapter 11, a wonderful chapter, you're going to hear what that king is like. Oh, and it is worth the wait. He is a wonderful king. He's the one we're waiting for. He's the, he's the ruler that we want. <laughs> and the character, the character in that chapter, chapter 11, is, is partially fulfilled by King David. But ultimately, truly, it is fulfilled in Jesus. It is good that God preserves this people because from them comes Jesus. And that is good news. 
Jesus is the good that God is working towards for his people. And so we've got to look at Jesus in these verses. If we don't look at Jesus, then judgment makes no sense. Hardship makes no sense because God just looks cruel or, or powerless. We've got to look at Jesus and see that God has been working. Because Jesus shows us what God is really like. So back to the question I asked at the start, how do you measure the love of God? And I wonder how the people of these verses would have measured it when things were falling apart around them. Because the temptation is, when things get hard, we write God off. Why doesn't God fix this? Well, why would God allow this? Does God love me? If he did love me, why is this happening? Because passages like this in Isaiah tell us that God is in complete control. It says that God is sovereign, sovereign over the Assyrians. God is bigger. God is just. God is faithful. That's what these verses say. And that all sounds great until something happens I don't like. But we can't measure God by how well our life is going. Sometimes we think we can do a better job than him, that I could run my life better. You know, we, we wish God was more like a, a genie in a lamp. If we're going to be honest, I think sometimes that's what we prefer. You know, whenever I want, I can just rub the lamp, dig him out, uh, use him to fix bits, fix the bits of my life that I'm struggling with, improve situations, ask him for help. But if you're being honest, who is God in that situation? I am. You are. You're playing God. It's about what I said earlier. It's about me, isn't it? It's about what I want. It's about how I think my life should go. And the question is, are we willing to believe that the God of the Bible is so immensely big that he may do stuff for our good that we don't understand? The creator creature divide that i mentioned a moment ago it's one of the most important divides most important distinctions in the universe and it is the one we like to cross the most it's the one we like to blur because we like control we need to measure we need to learn to measure the love of god by one thing just by one thing not circumstances not our situation, not how well things are going. We measure the love of God by one thing and one thing alone, and it's the cross. That is the measure of God's love for us. That is the measure of God's love for his people. And so just a quick story. A few years ago, as a family, Mary and I were told we'd never be able to have kids. And at the time, that felt pretty definite. And it was hard for a long while. For a long time, we spent that in mourning. And it was hard, particularly for Mary, as, as the emotion there is more, it's more physical. And there's so many questions, you know. Do I believe God is in control here? That's what the Bible says. Do I believe he's bigger than all this? Do I believe this stuff's out of his hands? Do I believe he's good? Yes. Do I believe he's, he's big in this situation? Yes. But that doesn't mean I understand it, and that doesn't mean I'm not upset by it and I don't weep. But the Bible tells me God is sovereign over all things. Now, in hindsight, looking back, do I understand it now? No, I don't. But God is good, and God is king, and God loves me because I can see Jesus on the cross. How do I know he loved me? He loved me so much he sent his child to die for me so that I can be a child of his family. So I'm not judging the love of God by that one situation. I'm judging it by the cross. Wonderfully, Mary gets pregnant. Uh, and you can imagine the emotion, can't you? Just the morning turning to, to joy. 30 weeks into the pregnancy, I get a phone call. 
Mary's inconsolable. Um, she's, she's speaking to me. She's weeping. She said, so Josh, I've been knocked over in the park. I've landed on the baby. The baby's not moving anymore. So I'm driving to the park and, and I find that she's sat on a bench. She's, she's weeping and I, I take to the car and we, we rush home to get the stuff she needs. We rush to the hospital. The whole way of the journey, what am I thinking? You know, this, this child might be dead. And I'm pleading with God. Of course I'm pleading with God. You know, what, what do I do? What do I do if the child is dead right now? After everything to, to get to this point, I have to be ready for that. I have to believe that, that there's a chance that's going to happen. Do I believe God still loves me in that situation? Do, do I believe God's still in control right now? Is God still sovereign? God is big, I get that. Is he bigger than this? And I will measure my love for God, not by whether that child lives or dies. The measure of God's love for me is found on this little hill outside Jerusalem. I may lose my daughter, but I know that God gave his son to die. And I don't understand it. But when I, I, I know that when I look at those two ugly bits of wood that form a cross, I know that God is love. And God is in control. Because that crucifixion, that was always the plan. You know, back in Isaiah 10, that was always the plan. Back in Genesis, back before the foundation of the world, the death of his son was always the plan, and God was working to bring that to completion. And that is the only place that you can find comfort and you can find peace. Because maybe your life feels out of control. Maybe it feels that everything's against you. Well, look at Jesus. Look at the cross, because the cross shows us in infinitely more detail those same three things that we've just seen in Isaiah. The cross shows us that God is bigger. Bigger than your worst fear. Bigger than your deepest shame. Bigger than sin. Bigger even than death. The cross shows us that God is just. That evil won't go unpunished. That the world will be held to account. And wonderfully and mercifully, the cross shows us that God is faithful to his people. <clears throat> that he has preserved for himself a people. And that he has done everything possible to keep them to the end. He has saved them. He has saved us. And his people, those who respond in faith and repentance, that's what Isaiah is asking, almost pleading with the people here. Are you one of them? Are you one of them that's responded in faith and repentance? To do so, you need to look at the cross. God is bigger. God is just and God is faithful. And he is worthy of our praise.